And then I can stop at this. Gina, do you see the right thing? Looks like this. So thanks for waiting. Yeah, so thank you. And welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining today's Chief Edit Seminar, the first one for the spring quarter. And it's a great pleasure to have the Lane here today as our speaker. Strictly introduced the Lane before his talk. Um, he got his bachelor in ICT at France and he got master's and um doctoral degree here at IGTP. <laughs> and after his um PhD, he got he did postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech. And he was appointed as Nanyang assistant professor at Nanyang University in the board and until 2018. And he moved to the University of Southern California as an associate professor. And his work has been recognized by several awards, including editor side fiction for us in referring more authentic reviewers. And his research mostly focuses on the physics of friction. Um, Paul Dynamics and the conspiracy determination during the seismic cycle. So we're going to have his talk, and then um, we'll appreciate questions from students first after his talk, and then we can move on to general discussion and questions. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the first speaker of the quarter, and uh, coincidentally, I'm speaking about friction just after the, the class from Alice and uh, Yuri on friction. So um, having been trained here, I know that uh, the IGPP grad students are the smartest people in the room, accounting for the professors. And so uh, I count on you to, uh, to follow what I'm talking about. It's been a long time in the making. It's not necessarily trivial, so I do my best to explain. But I'm going to describe the constitutive behavior of rocks during the seismic cycle. and. Uh, my motto here is that it's actually complicated. It is complicated. So I don't expect you to understand all in one talk. Um, I teach this for 40 hours and there's still things to cover, but it's tractable. It's complicated, but we understand it. Okay, I'm going to describe how we understand it, how we can predict it. So I'm going to explain things like that. You know, this is what Yuri was teaching us. Uh, in the first quarter of this class, the relationship between normal stress and stressful uh, fracture. And I'm going to explain where that comes from. So the motivation is that when we want to understand earthquakes, we want perhaps in the long term, as a long term proposition, predict earthquakes or some aspects of seismicity. And when we look, when we consider every major plate boundary and natural seismicity, we see patterns. You consider oceanic transforms, continental transform like the San Andreas, or subduction zones, you see that there is a depth dependence of the rupture styles. Uh, large earthquakes are typically uh, confined to the crust. Um, and uh, at, you know, continental transforms, there's shallow slip deficit that Curie has you know, advertised a lot. Uh, there's also uh, slow slip events on the San Andreas fault. They, they, they are typically shallow. Some of them are deep. On subduction zones, you have tsunami earthquakes, large earthquakes, slow slip events with various degrees of uh, tremor activity. And so if this is depth dependent, that means it's pressure and temperature controlled. Okay, So um, deciphering uh, how, how seismicity comes about and natural faults um, relies on understanding friction and the constitutive behavior of rocks during failure. Um, within the conditions that are met in um, mega thrusts or continental oceanic transforms. So, um, so if it relies on 
this constitutive behavior, and there's been decades of work on the constitutive behavior, why haven't we managed to figure it out already? That's because it's complicated and it depends on lithology, pressure, pore fluid pressure, slip rates, um, and, um, and hydrothermal conditions, temperature and, and um, the presence of fluids. And so there's a lot of controlling parameters and all of them play an important role in the, the constitutive behavior. So it's been difficult to even document the, uh, the, these behaviors in the laboratory. But after decades of laboratory work, we can have a collective look at all these observations and, and look for patterns. And I'm going to describe these patterns, explain them, and find essentially mathematical equations that describe them. And that's why it requires you to do a little bit of math with me. I'm going to start with looking at friction in isothermal conditions, room temperature, simple, except we're going to vary pressure and see what happens. So non-isobaric conditions, we're going to learn a lot from that. Then we're going to add the effect of temperature, so it's going to be non-isothermal. Turns out temperature controls a lot of different things, so we need to expand that a little bit more. And there is a direct dependence on temperature. The temperature also affects all the other parameters uh, by proxy. So we're going to see how biased hydrothermal conditions control stability and uh, the brittle ductile transition. So at the end of this, we're going to have a simple equation that describes all these effects in a very simple, compact way. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through that. So first, we're going to study the simplest case of uh, moving this hat. What is the frictional resistance of this thing? This is isothermal friction in non, -is in non isothermal conditions. So every natural surface is rough. Um, that means it has local microscale topography. And when I hold any object in my hand, there's only 3% of my hand that is actually in true contact with the bottle. Okay? And this contact happens at micro asperities that depend on the topography of my skin. Um, and so the true contact, we call this the real area of contact, is in fact occurring on tiny topographic highs on the rough topography that we call microasperities. Uh, and so if you want to understand friction, you want to understand what happens on these actual contacts, not elsewhere, where it's not in contact. There's been a lot of work on this, in the physics of microasperities. And one of this is a very influential classic work by uh, Dietrich and Kilgore in the 90s that directly image these contacts um, with uh, transparent material to see through, shine light, measure it on the other side. Uh, if it's in contact, lights go through. If it's not in contact, acts as a mirror, it bounces off, it becomes black. We invert the colors, you can image the contacts. And they look like that. So we're looking at uh, 50 micrometer here for scale. And they pressed on um, different materials, glass, calcite, um, acrylic, you know, transparent materials, and they press them in a different normal stress and see how thick this microasperity is because. Um, so that's the normal stress they applied, two, five, 10, 20, so red, yellow, purple, blue, and green. And you can see that these microasperities are small under low confining stress, larger uh, intermediate stress, and then very wide, uh, so in green, at the highest stress. Sometimes the initial contacts widen, sometimes new contacts form. Okay? They were initially not in contact and you press so hard that eventually they touch. And so as you increase normal stress, you, you increase the population of contacts and you increase their size, which is kind of intuitive. You, you press on anything, kind of collapses on its own shape and it flattens. We call this compaction creep. But what's wonderful, is that if you do that at any stress, but you do this for one second, so I do this one second and look, I wait 10 seconds, I wait an hour, I wait three days, it's not going to be the same size. And so now it's the same sort of colors going from young to old. And you can see that young, intermediate, old, and they just collapse into it under their own weight. You can flatter and flatter. 
So it's my prosperities have strong dependence on normal stress, but then they evolve spontaneously uh, as a function of time. And so there is a time component to um, the strength of contacts. So this is well understood from the laboratory side, but it's never really been put into equivalence. And so it hasn't been translated to a predictive relationship. Um, so that's what we're going to do now. Basically, what I'm going to do now is present an equation of state that describes what the area of contact will be between two solids under normal stress. Once we have that, we know exactly how much solid matter is in contact and we can describe strength. So if the physics is all about these micro asperities in contact, then we can look at the literature and see what we can predict from this. This was worked out in the 19th century, a uh, German uh, scientist of Hertz, who looked at the, it's an elastic problem. Uh, you imagine a sphere that you press onto a flat surface and you can calculate with some simplifying assumptions, um, the area of contact that will finally appear. And when you do that, you find the area of contact scales with the normal stress to the two third. Um, and so if the frictional strength that you need to, to slide this horizontally scales with the area of contact, it will predict that it scales with the normal stress to the two third. And if you go back to Leonardo da Vinci, Amonton, Coulon, they say no. It's linear with normal stress. It's not normal stress in two thirds. It turns out that they were all wrong, but we believed that for a while. So this forced other investigators to consider different geometries. They look uh, in the 50s, um, it was the heydays of uh, fractal geometries. And so they were like, oh, what if the spheres have a fractal topography? So it's going to be sphere that contains spheres themselves, other spheres and other spheres and other spheres. And if you do that, you really reduce the area of contact. It happens only on these very small spheres that are within the spheres. You know? um, and so the effective area of contact now scales almost linearly with normal stress. It's 26 to 27. Uh, and um, you can randomize fault surfaces and now you can say, you know, along this long surface, I'm going to have a lot of these micro asperities, but there's an overall long wavelength topography. And so they, 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 they want to start to be in contact from different heights. And so some of them you push, they don't even touch and you push more and they find it touch. So you, you randomize the starting heights of these micro asperities, but they all have the same radius. And when you do that, um, the area of contact on average is exactly linear with normal stress. 2%. Wonderful. We figured out uh, this problem. You have randomized programmatic heights. They are all in contact or not uh, randomly, and that creates an effective area that scales linear with normal stress, and that's compatible with normal friction and what Leonardo said. So I will show you later that these three famous characters were all wrong. And but for non-trivial reasons, it's um... so. I'm going to write a constitutive relationship. It's basically an equation of state. Um, why? It predicts the area of contact density, so number between zero and one, as a function of normal stress, the size of micro asperities, and normal stress again to a power. Why do I do this? If you choose beta equals zero you get the Greenwood and Williamson randomized asperities and it scales linearly with normal stress. If you choose beta equals one third, you get the Hertz contact from the 19th century. And if you get beta is one over 27, you get the offshore fractal uh, spheres. So it's a generalization of all, all these previous results that, are, that is parameterized with one uh, parameter beta. Um, and then um, it's an equation of state because it is path independent. Doesn't matter. You have a long history of deformation that led you to this micro asperity size and this normal stress. No matter what the history, if these are these values today, it will have this area of contact now.
Okay. So then, how do we get to that formulation? Um, we're going to assume that the shear strength is simply linear with uh, the area of contact. So we start with this relationship. That's the area of contact. I can predict how many, how much these two surfaces will touch each other. Okay. And that we can go back to the experiments of Dietrich and Kilgore. Uh, and they have measured these quantities in the lab for four different materials, acrylic, calcite, glass, and quartz, transparent. And if you look at, uh, these, these are power laws. So if you look at the area of contact as a function of normal stress in log log space, the slope is the power exponents. Okay? Um, they also control the asperity size by choosing different grids. So different ways to, to prepare the surface. And so we can uh, constrain these, these powers. And beta is never zero meaning the relationship between uh, area of contact and normal stress is never linear. So in, at the end of the day, Hertz was correct. It did not need to be corrected. Um, so most of these contacts are Hertzian, essentially. So we can calibrate this equation of state against data and take it for granted. Then we want to derive a rate-independent yield criterion. Right, uh, this is your high school experiment, put an object on the table, I tilt it, at which angle will it fall? So we say, well, it is when the shear stress, um, uh, uh, when the shear stress uh, meets the yield stress. And what is the yield stress? It's simply the area of contact times uh, uh, the material property. This material property is the plowing hardness. Um, and so you have a simple prediction of the yield strength. And then you have the equation for the area of contact. So you substitute. And you realize that these powers are small. You didn't neglect that. And so you get chi s divided by chi n times sigma. Otherwise, written as um, shear stress is mu naught times sigma. So mu naught is simply the ratio of material strength. And that's why it's relatively uniform in the universe because these two material properties scale with each other um, given a mineral structure, etc. So we can basically explain the origin of um, amontons and Coulomb friction as a static failure criterion. It's simply this relationship uh, using the area of contact. However, we have neglected a few things to get to that point. That's why it's almost, it's only an approximate relationship. And what do we lose in this approximation? Slow slip events, earthquakes, tremors, creep, seismicity, right? So it's important to actually go to the higher order details to predict earthquakes. So what we need is a rate-dependent rate failure criterion. I mean, earthquakes should have prefaced with that, that they live in a space of 10 orders of magnitude of, the, of slip rate. When a fault is creeping, it's a nanometer per second. When it's doing an earthquake, it's a meter per second. So it matters how fast it's failing. So instead of writing ti equals mu sigma like that, we say, wait, hold on. The velocity is a function of stress. And stress, we should gauge the stress relative to the yield strength. So if the stress is above, it should be very high velocity, essentially failure. If it's uh, below, much below, then it's extremely small. And in fact, if there's no stress, there's no velocity, right? And uh, we can do this experiment all the time. Uh, this is not stressed and it's not moving. It sounds trivial, but all the, friction laws out there uh, predict otherwise. So it's a good behavior. Now you substitute the area of contact in the yield strength and you get this equation, which is a rate, state, and normal stress dependence on friction. So it explains the relatively more advanced uh, friction laws that were developed in the early 80s. Okay.
It's simply these, these parameters represent more precisely the evolution of the area of contact. What's beautiful is that the size of contacts evolve over time. They've shown the experiments. You let them alone and they flatten. So there's a time dependence to uh, the size of contacts. This um, is a little more difficult to explain in, in a few minutes, but basically, when you have a micro asperity um, that is under very hard, very high load, it will flatten to something flatter and uh, wider. And so basically, this flattening is viscoelastic flow. So what you have to understand is that when you apply normal stress to an asperity, it experiences it as shear stress because on the sides it is traction free. And so it undergoes deviatory stress and therefore it flows. And when it flows, it flatters. So all you have to do is write a creep law for this micro asperity. So it's going to be strain rate equals stress to a power and we're done. The strain rate is the rate of change of the size relative to the size. It's the strain rate. This is a power law of stress and it's, it has a grain size dependence. It's classic crystal plasticity, okay? So that's a creep law parameterized with grain size or uh, size of micro asperities, which is our dynamic variable. Um, so it flattens under applied stress. And then of course, if you shear it, well, you will rejuvenate the contact and that's a purely geometrical fact. So we're going to define this term as the healing. You can also define it as compaction creep, uh, but it's going to heal the contact because it's going to flatten the micro asperities, increase the area of contact and strengthen the material. And so we call this, we call this healing. And this, we call it weakening, contact rejuvenation. Uh, so these are two terms. In this equation, you define a linear strain rate is healing minus weakening. Um, but you can also say, I'm going to take the strain rate as the log of the ratio of these quantities. And that does exactly the same. So this is the healing term divided by the weakening term. You can see the, the, the fraction is uh, flipped. So that's the ratio. And you take the log, and that's uh, another expression. So these two things are um, produce almost the same results, the different evolutionary effects, but they produce the same size of micro asperities at steady state. And so what we can do is examine the value of friction after all of these evolutionary effects uh, have uh, finished and evolved. So it predicts a certain size that's velocity dependent and normal stress dependent. So we can substitute size for these properties so and what we get, I yeah. Just, so like, I just at the very bottom, what do you mean with instantaneous? Uh, so instantaneous states would have different sensitive general stress. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the size of the microasperities depends on normal stress to the Q. And here it was to the beta, to the beta end. So there is a, a normal stress dependence of the flow law and a normal stress dependence of the healing that have different powers. Yeah, thank you for helping me, helping you. Um, so we can look at the steady state friction coefficient and look at that. It's dependent on the velocity to some power that can be positive or negative. And it depends on the normal stress that can be greater or lower than one. So depending on the sign of this power, you can be velocity weakening or velocity strengthening. Velocity weakening is a traditional way of generating earthquakes, of nucleating earthquakes. There are other ways. And look, it predicts that friction is a function of normal stress. You see that? Uh, and we calibrated the area of contact low, so it, it's, it's data driven. So is that absurd? Absolutely. Okay. I take uh, some of the most famous paper of uh, the frictional literature, in geophysics at least, Biolis 1978, the year I was born, okay? And there are five pages in this paper that only has 10, dedicated to showing that 
the frictional stress is nonlinear with normal stress. Nonlinear, even shows the equation and everything. But being who we are, we'll say, ah, it's kind of linear. <laughs> okay? So this sort of weird approximation of nonlinearity has been called Diley's law. Which is not a law, it's not even the data, what the data show. In fact, if you calculate the friction coefficient, you just divide shear stress by normal stress. It looks like that. It's not constant at all. Not at all. In fact, um, it is unbounded. It goes to infinity at vanishing normal stress. Now, Alice, you know what we say? Uh, by this law, take a friction coefficient at 0.6. Okay? What is that? This is the kind of the the slope here, it's 0.6. Now, it's a function of normal stress, right? So when you simulate earthquakes, because you do that a lot, what normal stress do you use? Off yeah. the cuff. Um, little, little static gradient. <clears throat> That's not what you use. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Where's your student? Where's Gina? <laughs> <laughs> She's using constant normal stress. What do you use for normal stress? Even yeah, slightly different, huh? That's different, yes. Yeah, okay. So at 30 kilometer depths, what is the oh. lithostatic? A gig gigapascal? Something like that. That would be here. But now if you take Gina's number, which is what most people use, you are here on the plot. You're here. Where it's not 0.6 at all, right? And so we can explain all of this data curated by Biolin by various parameters that predict either you know uh, greater than one or lower than one if you decaying friction or increasing friction with normal stress. So you can actually explain the data. And we see this pattern a lot. It's really widespread. If you take various uh, rock sedimentary metamorphic igneous uh, plot shear stress as a function of normal stress, you will find a nonlinear relationship, you calculate the friction coefficient, you would see that it is diverging uh, with vanishing normal stress. It is widespread. So, Coulomb friction law is incorrect uh, and should not be used. And this predicts a more general relationship with normal stress. But remember, it is only the steady state one. In fact, it varies differently as a direct effect and an evolutionary phase. Now, only after these effects, it converges to these values. So there's even more to it that is not captured in the classical friction laws. So that's the general trend. The exception is phyllosilicates. Uh, this is also kind of a nice paper uh, dedicated to phyllosilicates where it increases. This is directly the friction coefficient as a function of normal stress. You can see this um, uh, uh, slowly increasing trends with vanishing value now. Um, uh, vanishing normal stress. So the two patterns exist. Um, so it turns out that the steady state is linked to, uh, it's the net difference between the direct effect when you change normal stress, what happens, and then you wait a minute for the evolutionary effects to take place. And so you have the direct effect, evolutionary phase, and the difference gives you the steady state. So what happens during that time? Uh, to model this, we need to understand the friction law and the evolution law together and see what happens. There's data for that. This is Linker and Dietrich, um, to, uh, 1992. Velocity steps, that's enough to constrain uh, the velocity dependence parameters, uh, like this one. And so with the same material and the same condition, you do now loading and unloading sequences of normal stress. And you can see the, the how the material responds to that, and it's never direct. There is in fact, when you change the normal stress, there's no change of shear stress. It's everything is evolutionary. And it transitions to a new steady state after some finite slip distance. And the model captures this. So what actually happens is that in reality, friction, the friction coefficient does not exist. It's a made up thing. So if you assume a relationship like this, just in your head, but in reality, the strength versus no normal stress is nonlinear. It is nonlinear, but if you think it's linear, 
you will have a direct effect because your head predicts no effect, but reality is different. So there's a delta. Change normal stress, change strength immediately. It's a new strength, a new normal stress. So that kicks in a new evolutionary phase that takes a finite amount of sleep to happen. And this healing can uh, converge to a value that's above the previous value, same previous value and lower. If that's the case, the net effect will be here, um, a friction coefficient that does not depend on friction, like a Monton and Coulomb said, but what they missed is this whole curve to get to that point, right? So it's hugely dependent on normal stress, but it compensates later on. It can also be slightly different, a little bit, because you're talking about the difference of two large numbers. Difference can be small. It can be overall increasing with friction or decreasing with friction. Both cases are possible. Final silicates do this. Pretty much all other works do that. And sometimes you land on your feet and it's exactly the same, but it's a coincidence. So, so, so that's what actually happens when you perturb the normal stress. Then at steady state, you have a nonlinear curve. And that nonlinear curve, you can do a Taylor Swift extension here and you find you know, expression that's familiar. You can do it here. It's Taylor series expansion. It depends where you do it. You do it here or there, you get different uh, prefactors and different slopes. And that's the slopes that we call Darwin's law, but it's not a law, it's just a local approximation. Okay. Um, so that's what happens in uh, non isobaric conditions. So now if we add uh, temperature, it becomes uh, widely different. But in terms of modeling, it's pretty trivial. We had a rate dependent law that's based on the friction law, right? So relative to what the area of contact predicts, uh, uh, controls the, the, the sliding velocity, and you just make this thermally activated. Okay, So it's a quick law, it's power law of stress with a thermal activation. What do we have as parameters? The activation energy, the activation temperature, and it's an Arrhenius relationship. Uh, Q divided by T naught is the change of entropy of the, of the deformation. I admit, I think of deformation as a chemical reaction, but I'll explain that later. And then for the, um, when you do that, you substitute the yield strength, which is controlled by the air of contact with what it is, and you get a rate, state, normal stress, temperature dependent friction law, okay? And that's just for the direct effect. Uh, however, temperature also activates the creep of microasperities. So when you apply normal stress to the microasperity, it collapses faster at higher temperature than at lower temperature. So every aspect of creeping is uh, thermally activated. So now the heating term that uh, I discussed before is given a temperature dependence with another activation energy and another uh, 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 change of entropy. You can find the additive form, this minus that, this term is unaffected, or the log of the ratio. These are two possible alternatives. It doesn't matter that much. Um, when you do this, you can test this against uh, laboratory experiments. It's very difficult in the lab to change temperature dynamically very fast. So Chester and his collaborator Higgs uh, in the, in the 80s and 90s found a trick. They said, look, in friction, we look at the evolution of strength as a function of slip. What about I change temperature very slowly in a very safe way, but when I load the sample at a nanometer per second, then when I plot it as a function of slip, it will look like instantaneous. So that's what they did. They have a series of experiments where they first conduct a velocity step so they drive it, they drive the, the shortening at different rates. And then once they go to a very low rate, they impose a change of temperature, which is plotted as a function of slip. If I plot it as a function of time, it would be it's very gradual change, okay? Um, and look at that. Change of velocity, you have a direct effect in an evolutionary phase. Change of temperature, you have a direct effect in an evolutionary phase. Change of velocity, 
So a change of temperature has qualitatively the same character as a change of velocity. They are, they are conjugate variables. You can do something fast or you can do something hot. It leads to similar behaviors. Not exactly the same, but similar. So we can, you know, there's a certain symmetry in the system. So the black line is the data, the red line is uh, the model. And so it's very simple. The, the direct effect, the change of friction with temperature depends uh, on the activation energy for sliding. At steady states, it's the difference of the activation energy for sliding and the activation energy for healing. Why? If you warm up something, you do the dishes at, at hot water, right? That's because everything flows faster. So it's the same thing for friction. So if you if you warmed the material, it should always be softer, and yet it's not. Why? Because when you when you heat it up, you also activate healing, and so it softens and hardens simultaneously. And it's only the difference between these two effects that control the final strength, and that's why. The activation is the difference of activation energies that control that. And the difference is small, and therefore the effective effect of temperature is small. But it's only small after very large effects that compensate each other. So there's direct evolutionary phase and final steady state response to temperature. So, yeah. Um, how do you just comp temperatures compared to temperatures in a size of uh, this particular one? Yeah, are, are the experiments at higher temperatures? So this is uh, written here, so it's 52 and 80, yeah. I think, something like that. So 58 and 82, yeah. So it's done at room temperature, close to room temperature, because the rig itself has a temperature response, and so that, which is very complex. And so within that range of temperature, I won't say that Fred Chester is sure that this is the sample response and not the machine response. Mm -hmm. But um, you can investigate the effect of temperature up to 1,000 degrees, but not during the, last, the temperature steps. That's just too sensitive. Just you raise it to another temperature, wait five hours, and then do the experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm dis I'll discuss that later. <laughs> so to bring back the seismologists in the room, um, I want to remind you that we liked, you know, since uh, Kanamori, we like to discuss uh, energetics of earthquakes in terms of fracture energy, radiated energy, heat. And one way to do this is to consider that earthquakes evolve strength in a linear slip weakening model. They initially re-strengthen with the arrival of a rupture fault. <laughs> then they weaken uh, because high velocity or rejuvenate your contacts. You weaken and then you evolve at a constant strength that gives rise to a linear Model. Well, it turns out that everything that I've been telling you so far, when you take the constitutive relationship and add boundary conditions and, and, and forcing terms, it predicts the linear sleep weakening profile that's been used in seismology for like 40 years. So uh, if you do numerical simulations that use the constitutive relationship I mentioned, this is the evolution of strength as a rupture fault arises. There's an indication strengthening, it's called the direct effect, and then a linear, quasi-linear weakening, and then an evolution of constant strength. And so if you don't care about friction and you're using linear slip weakening models, well, we're friends because I explained the linear slip weakening model. Okay, that's where it comes from. Turns out that it explains other things as well. It's not always linear slip weakening. Slow slip events are not following linear slip weakening uh, curve. In fact, it's following that pattern only at certain or certain parameters. So it generalizes uh, this phenom phenomenological relationship. What's interesting is that, in fact, uh, this is pretty much a model anyways. And in reality, um, faults don't continue at constant strength. And now there's discussions about why they re-strengthen. Um, so that's when the temperature effects come in because if you harden, uh, if you increase temperature, you re-strengthen because you activate healing. And so in nature, that happens continuously because you slide, there's shear heating, like rubbing your hands, that raises temperature, that activates healing, that re-strengthens, all within the few seconds of the rupture. 
And that gives rise now to almost a linear reciprocating profile, but with rehardening on the back end. And it turns out that if you, if a rupture starts, manage to stop and then heats up and then restrengthen, it stops. And so it creates these stuttering earthquakes that a lot of earthquakes are stopping and stopping and stopping. And we call them tremors. And so when you take temperature effects into account, you can explain tremors uh, by the constitutive behavior of healing. Okay, so now that I have the seismologist back, we can talk about friction. So temperature does a lot of other things. That's why temperature is perhaps the most complicated effect of friction. So in the language of um, classical uh, friction literature, there's these two parameters, A and A minus B, that describe the velocity dependence as a direct effect or a steady state. So they're very useful to, to discuss uh, properties with. So A and A minus B, direct effect, steady state effect. Why? It's easily measured in the lab as well. And so people have done that. They've measured A and A minus B in the lab. And these are these curves. The black um, arrow bars are A and the red ones are A minus B. Different people, different labs, different rocks, granite, curve, parts, and shell, um, natural samples that have a complex uh, mixture of different minerals. And, and the condition of these experiments that are not universal, A is constant for zero to 500 degrees. Constant, 100 to 700 degrees. A is constant. And that's an important data set because there is a lot of theories out there that predict that it should not be, namely the theory put forth by Jim Rice in 2001. So on that matter, on that subject, um, the data is invaluable with that. But look at A minus B, look at that. It's constant, piecewise constant. It's constant and then it's another constant. It's constant by steps. It's not even gradient changing. It's, it wants to be constant for a certain regime of temperature, and then it's another one. So temperature is not just activating one process more or less. It's actually deciding which process will take place, okay? And when it's process one, you're gonna have these properties, process two, these properties, but it's an on and off switch between process one and process two. So that's what the data tell us. And it's not doing anything to A, but it's changing B a lot. We see A is constant, A minus B changes, so B changes. And so to do this, we need to be able to switch mechanisms of healing. And there's one simple way of doing it. We count all of them. So this is the thermally activated healing that I mentioned before. I just add a sum, but that's all I did. And every healing mechanism, and its derivations have different activation energies and activation temperatures. And I, I should qualify this, not necessarily different mechanisms. It can be your old friend, viscoelastic flow, but acting on different minerals. Therefore, you have different activation energies. Or minerals have different shapes that would change, perhaps not the activation energy, but the, the stress power exponent. You know, so geometry, mineralogy and uh, mechanisms properly um, matter. It could be another mechanisms. Uh, viscoelastic is kind of the backup dry condition mechanism. But if it's wet, it can be pressure solution. Uh, another way is uh, fracturing. If you fracture your asperities, you have, instead of one big fat one, you have a fractured one and that flattens the contact of all. So many things can happen. And therefore you need different ways different mechanisms. So when you do that, the model will capture the gradual transition of healing mechanism as a function of temperature. So I like to show raw data. You go in the lab, you force a sample at different speeds. You will have um, a direct effect and an evolutionary phase, right? Direct effect, evolutionary phase. Uh, but if you do it at different temperatures, if you do it near room temperature, it will be just velocity strengthening. You see there's no reversal of direction, right? It goes in one direction, it goes down. And if you do it at 200 degrees, it goes down and up. And now it's exactly the strength, the same strength before and after. So it's velocity neutral. 
And then you do it at high temperature and it would transition to even stiff stick slip events, so it will be unstable. So the model captures the gradual transition between velocity strengthening and velocity weakening. So that's important because it shows that the frictional properties of rocks are not stationary. If you do this at one velocity or one temperature, and you do it at another velocity and another temperature, it's not going to be the same behavior. And it's complicated, but we understand it. Okay. So now temperature does many other things, and that's the last thing I want to mention. It also activates different ways to shear. So far, I've only thought about different ways to compact, but you can shear in different ways. And Yuri mentioned it. You can be brittle, semi-brittle, or ductile. Right? Who was in the class? Yeah? So three ways. Three ways. Brittle, another name for it is cataclysis. Uh, it's a combination of behavior that involves fracturing in the micro scale. And fracturing enables shearing. But it can involve also components of ductile flow, even in that regime or granular flow even, localized granular flow within the gout with a very thin sample, generally a combination of these things. And in the lab, if we take the same sample, same mineralogy, same normal stress, same possibly pressure, but we shear them at different temperatures, they would exhibit, they can sometimes exhibit very different responses. And by eye, you can tell it's a different mechanism. So I'm going to give you three examples. It's wet olivine, dry olivine, and basalt. Uh, and if you do it at generally low temperature, so this is low temperature for a dry sample, um, you know, depends on the hydrothermal conditions. So you get a rate and state response. So there's a direct effect and an evolutionary phase typically in the other direction, right? Okay. So direct effect, evolution, direct effect, Evolution. So it rate, slip rate, and state dependent. If you do it at much higher temperature, you get what looks like only a rate dependent response. So there's no memory effect, there's no evolutionary phase. So it's definitely something that is the result of a different physics. You can still call it frictional because you can always divide the field stress by a normal stress and get a number, but it's not the same physics. And uh, so there's different mechanisms of shear. It's, it's not friction, but it still matters because it's in the crust. And I don't care if it's frictional or not. I want to understand earthquakes. So there's different ways you can shear things with different responses. So the trick is the same. There's different ways to shear. Add them up. You have the strain rate, the stress to a power. Strain rate is always infinitesimal. You can add up little things. So if you can strain it by one mechanism or another or a third or whatever, just sum them up and see who contributes the most. Um, and so now you have the sum of the stress to the power and thermally active, activated uh, deformation of different mechanisms of shear, cataclysis, semi-brittle flow, ductile flow even. And if you do this, Anything can contribute to shearing. And if it's too cold, well, the ductile mechanisms will be exceedingly small. You can neglect them. And therefore, you remove the sun. Okay. Be cold. If you are at uh, 2,000 degrees, well, the ductile mechanisms will dominate, guaranteed. And so you can neglect the first one. And it's, it's still, it becomes a, a crystal plasticity law. And so when you write like that, you can capture the brittle ductile transition. Just you can, this explains rocks from the surface to the formental boundary. Okay, just as simple as that. Then how does it work? So you have two mechanisms um, in black. One has a low power exponent. This is velocity and fuel traction. And the other one has a high power exponent. So this is fuel traction. You can interpret this in different ways. You can say in nature, nature will pick the mechanism with the least energy. That's not how nature does it, but kind of a helpful thing to say. So it would take this path and then that path. This is a simplification. In fact, both mechanisms still are active. It's just one that produces much less strain than the other. Uh, so it's not picking one over the other. Both are there, but you can neglect that to first order. 
And if you move, if you change the temperature, and these mechanisms have different temperature sensitivities, different activation energies, it will shift the position in uh, velocity at which the transition happens. So you will you will see not only a velocity dependence of the mechanisms, but a temperature. So it will be useful to plot the behavior of rocks in a velocity temperatures uh, map. And we call this uh, information map, okay? So having two mechanisms is a trivial explanation for, for finding retroactive transitions and um, associated behavior. So we go down to uh, um, um, the, some of the most influential paper on uh, friction that relates to seismicity, which is the work on wet west, uh, westerly granite from Blampede uh, 1995, 1998, that um, look at everything friction. So the friction coefficient itself, the, the velocity dependence A, and the steady state velocity dependence A minus B, identify a velocity weakening regime between 150 and 250 that seems to match with the depth of seismicity in California. Uh, and you can see uh, that the friction coefficient increases with temperature first, and then it decreases drastically with temperature after a certain threshold. And so that's the brittle to semi-brittle transition. So here, this is not frictional anymore. This is semi-brittle with an extreme sensitivity to temperature and it weakens this temperature. And so that's very interesting because it's temperature hardening first while it's velocity weakening, and then it's temperature weakening while it is velocity strengthening. So it's sort of a miracle because you can still have instabilities at any depth. Because if your velocity is strengthening, your temperature is softening and you can have thermal instabilities. So, so and, and the model captures this behavior uh, quite well. And so on the San Andreas Fault, this is Park Field, where it's quite shallow, about seven kilometer depth. Uh, we found slow slip at much greater depth in the, lower, in the mid to lower crust at depth where it should be velocity strengthened. So we can explain this behavior by saying that these slow slip events are in fact the result of frictional, of thermal instabilities. Shear heating uh, uh, increases the temperature in the fault, the temperature weakens the fault, the weakened fault creates a stress drop, stress drop creates slip, and you have a slow slip event. So we can connect this constitutive behavior to a lot of natural observation, measure tremors, sorts of events, etc. Now, we're going to take some of the most uh, comprehensive data sets on the effect of temperature and velocity. That's the work of Niemeyer and colleagues, 2016, using samples from the uh, Alpine Fault gouge in uh, the Alpine Fault in South, South Island, New Zealand. And uh, What's extraordinary about it is the, the very low slip rate that it's forcing this fault. So it's going down to 10 to the minus two micrometer per second. But in, in reality, to go there, you need to go lower and then jump to that speed. So it's basically going to a nanometer per second. And Andre said it took 150 hours to, to do this. And But it's not just one run, it's run at you know, different temperatures. And then this is also very slow, this is very slow, and then that becomes very fast. And in their paper, they mentioned it follows no pattern. It's just too complicated. Um, and so it's velocity strengthening in the upper quadrant when it's uh, fast and cold. And it's velocity strengthening when it's slow and hot. And it's velocity weakening in a weird range of temperatures in between. And in fact, you can perfectly explain this. Um, here you have two heating mechanisms. So this is a change of weakening to strengthening at constant A. So it's the same mechanism of shear, but it's not the same mechanism of compaction. So you have that transition. And then here it's the brittle to semi-brittle transition. And it's a change of rate and state friction in all this domain to just rate dependent shear. No memory effect, no state variable. So it's a different mechanism entirely. And that's wonderful because it explains why you would have slow slip but at shallow depth that would not transition to an earthquake because increase the velocity, it becomes strengthening, and that kills rupture. 
So that explains uh, uh, shallow slow sleep in the San Andreas, explains why you have a shallow sleep deficit in most uh, continental earthquakes. Uh, that's a constitutive behavior. It also explains why you can't nucleate at great depth, because no matter what, your velocity is strengthening at the velocities relevant to nucleation. But if you can nucleate at intermediate depth, propagate the great depth at high speed, you will meet velocity weakening regions. At that speed, they are. And that, that's why you can occasionally rupture the whole crust. And there is evidence in the field uh, from Scandinavia and also the largest continent, the largest strike slip earthquake, 2012 Indian Ocean earthquake, ruptured the whole lithosphere on the oceanic fracture zone, uh, probably by this mechanism. So you cannot initiate, but you can propagate at great depth. Um, okay, so constitutive behavior explains a lot of things. So I've mentioned the effect of velocity, uh, of te temperature, temperature and velocity are strongly coupled. Uh, we see this effect for a wide number of rocks. They're not all as well documented as the work of Andre, but they still show the same pattern. Um, so if you increase velocity, you will see a transition of different A minus B, it's an increasing trend everywhere you look. And if you do it at different temperatures, it just moves, it shifts that transition at different velocities. So that's the velocity temperature trade-off. Um, we did some work on uh, uh, wet olivine. Olivine is the weaker sample, weaker mineral of the, the, the mantle. And for olivine, we see three mechanisms as function of temperature. We see brittle transitioning to semi-brittle, transitioning to ductile. And what we find is that the so-called brittle ductile transition that we talked about with Christmas tree diagrams is in fact an approximation of a smoother transition that involves the semi-brittle behavior. The, the, the brittle ductile transition is a function of temperature, obviously, but also a function of velocity. And when you do strength of the lithosphere, don't think about that too much because the strain rates are small. But on a fracture zone, they're not. They can vary by nine orders of magnitude. And so you can get a wide dynamic range of depth of the brittle ductile transition, depending on how fast the fracture zone uh, slips. And if you take the fastest, it brings it down to greater depth. And that's why when you have fast earthquakes, you can actually make the lithosphere brittle and then propagate earthquakes there. Uh, and that matches uh, roughly the very small number of earthquakes that we know uh, occurred in along fracture zones. So, um, so it connects to the strength of the lithosphere and how it changes dynamically. So you can think of it as being important for uh, the onset of plate tectonics on Earth and, uh, and on other planets. So the constitutive behavior of rocks are fundamental to understanding uh, our dynamic planet. So I said it, it's complicated. I, I don't want to hide it, but it's tractable. We understand it. And it's not a simple relationship that we've been taught for me in high school um, or, or other more complicated things that are also wrong. It is, uh, it is more complex than that, but completely tractable. So the constitutive behavior of rocks, everything that we see, so slip, Earthquakes, tremors, earthquakes that are pulse like, crack like, super shear, um, thermal instabilities, brittle ductile transition can be explained by two equations. It's as compact as it can make it. That involve uh, the, the, the sliding of faults as a function of stress, state variable, normal stress, and temperature. And the size of the area of contact essentially evolves through that parameter which involves multiple healing mechanisms that are all thermally activated, a function of normal stress and brain size dependent. Uh, so with that, we can explain rocks in many varied tectonic contexts and, uh, and make sense of the observations we see otherwise. So I'll stop here. Thank you. For the talk, and is there any students having the questions? Sure.
when you sum all these mechanisms, do you consider they all collect from the bulk interface, or this mechanism is also considered the bulk? This one? Yeah, this is um, considering only the gauge, which is a very tiny, finite volume. So it's not considering the damage zone or the breccia that's uh, around it. The common ideas, though, is that um, individual events rupture different sections of the breccia. And that's why it builds a damage zone over very long time scales. But event by event, it's still localized. Uh, that's a common idea. And so that captures the single event. Yeah. Uh, so you can add uh, the reality of the surrounding domain. It will be a simplified version of that. Maybe, maybe only one mechanism, but it will be very similar in mathematical form. Different parameters, maybe. different uh, activation energies. Yeah. In fact, in seismology, we see uh, uh, we see a drop of uh, seismic shear velocity and a recovery, time dependent recovery. We also call it healing. It's the same equation. Yeah, and that that's the bulk. Any one other than students? Yeah, it's very simple. Very simple. Very simple. Because uh, it's new. <laughs> so if you could go back in time and tell them, then <laughs> yeah. What would you know to do? I mean, you could um, also, uh, consider like conservation of energy in the long run. Uh, the same thing we do uh, before. Uh, so you can write this as um, V is a function of stress, or you can write stress is a function of V. But when there's a sum, you can't invert that relationship in close form. When there's no sum, it's a trivial thing to do. And then go back on our sheets, uh, it's a power law instead of a log. Ah, big deal. Uh, but the proper way of doing it is V is a function of stress because you can add strain rates, but you cannot add stress. Stress is not additive. Strain rate is additive. Uh, and uh, so I can see that it's going to be problematic in some specific numerical schemes, but the one I use it, so. Yeah, I was thinking more about length scales that might introduce a problem that are very, very small and suddenly need to be resolved. Um, to resolve, resolve the yeah, this model, uh, um, average the behavior within a small volume. So you don't have to resolve this volume numerically more than you used to. Yeah, more than you used to. Because I don't write strain rate here, I write V. So it's um, it's basically the same as we've been doing before in terms of numerical schemes. It's just a different constitutive law. So it's it's, it's relatively simple to implement, and I have implemented it, but I can't show you everything. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know your name, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um. So this isn't my area of research yeah. at all, but I really appreciated it because it's uh, sort of an approach to scientific investigation, which is very similar to my own approach. Yeah. You're using constitutive, uh, constitutive laws, um, but correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of like a top-down approach to scientific investigation where you uh, observe phenomena mm. Mm. and you come up with yeah. a relation which is not necessarily built up from the ground it's, yes it's not built up from it's not first principle i know the answer before i put it together yeah 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 and so yeah. one of the risks here is that you can accidentally come up with a model which by chance fits the data oh my gosh i wish that was true <laughs> uh, <laughs> i but you i don't, don't yeah I, I don't have infinite time and i can't show you all the models that i put together mm -hmm. very much well, okay. that's so the, there's an the enormous risk. process of elimination yeah. here that you don't see because I don't want to waste your time. But then you're doing you're right. testing so many hypotheses. Yeah, like you have to know head. the data enough to understand which observations are truly independent of yeah. the others, so you can test a corner of the model at a time, yeah, without affecting anything else. If you're lucky, that can happen. Many times, it, it's so convoluted that yeah, have to explain everything or nothing. Yeah. And that's why I spent many years doing this mm. to find the one that, that works. So it's a two pronged approach. I want to fit the data, but I also want it to make sense, you know? Yeah. Uh, this is not an interpolating function. Okay. So it makes sense from the ground up. 
but having known that it will work, you know, after doing my homework, so I approach it from two angles. So another thing that you can do is make predictions. Yeah. The so thermal instability is one not really well they were by Chester, even though he didn't write it, it was in his equations. Uh, but um, uh, predicting earthquake swans mm -hmm. is an uh, outcome of this. Predicting uh, tremors from that. Predicting pulses and cracks in normal earthquakes is an outcome of this, which is not trivial uh, otherwise. But I should show other things that um, my positive is working, and it's not really my work, but um, we can predict the area of contact. And that's it's never in any of the previous formulations. So you can ask any other model. It's not going to predict. Um, it's not going to predict that. And that happens, in my opinion, that's how we're going to predict real earthquakes. Turns out that the area of contact controls the conductivity of the flow, the electric conductivity, and the acoustic transmissivity, and the optical uh, thickness. If you want to call it like that. Well, rocks are not transparent, so it doesn't matter that much. That means we can monitor this by proxy in the field. We can certainly do it in the lab. Absolute certainty on that. Um, question, can we do it in the field technologically? And if we can, we have the, the state variable at our disposal. And so when it nucleates, we're going to see it in the area of contact before there's any strain in the crust. We can predict earthquakes weeks ahead of, of any strain uh, anomaly. So that's the goal. That would be very exciting. And so that's something that's not uh, you know at heart. Mm -hmm. That's real. Mm -hmm. And this is calibrated. I've shown you simple cases we calibrated against less trivial cases. So it is robust. It may not be final, you can add some other things, but it's doing a good job. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll ask the last question to relate with everyone. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting to do the combination of the perspective, like there is some location before that. So, from the location you're implying, it's called the center of equal participation. Oh, yeah, sometimes they are equal That's right. So, that's a transition. Yeah, it's a smooth transition. So, no, I mean, I guess that. Is, is this a coincidence or is this what is so your last five three moment by putting the combination of that and such a sum? Yeah, there is no no weakening. I know rather weight is the velocities that each mechanism predicts. Yeah, so it's yeah, so it is. Uh, I mean they sum the results. I mean they rate themselves. One predict the meter of a second, the other two meter per second. Well, this one is the one to go in it. So the weight is the they're all their own weights. Right. Uh, if we were summing uh, strength, for example, or looking at strength, then it would be, would be uh, uh, a more complicated weight. But here it's velocity, predicting velocity. So the weights are themselves. Yeah. Uh, but I, I discussed this uh, smooth brittle ductile transition with Kate uh, Richards, who was doing her postdoc here, looking at that. She said, yeah, we know that. The brittle the lab this is not really stick. Like you're not telling us anything. Yeah. You have a question. Oh um, uh, sorry. First fascinating talk. I find it from what I do difficult to understand. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Now in insofar as from what I do, there are underlying physics here in the thinking about the tribology. Mm -hmm. Of the system, if you think about the friction, then you have a bunch of really small grains in between there. Yeah. And that the contact forces are not, you always have non homogeneous force distribution. It's always history dependent. Oh, yeah. Such that there is memory and how we have a pair of faults or the contact. Yeah. And it seems like you're erasing memory by checking what a force is, what the velocity is. Yeah. Velocity eventually erases. Yeah. And, and so a lot of the ideas imply to me that the underlying physics that governs the brains of something really small, yeah. and not how much it goes away. No. I, I thought you were different here to say it controls the micro, the macro scale. 
Right, but it goes away in contract. But this slip it doesn't go away immediately. It controls the electric back, controls the transient. And so there is a connection. It's just not a one to one connection. But the micro scale is run by the micro scale. Mm -hmm. And the micro, the thing that matters the most in my opinion is where the contact is. Except when you squeeze stuff together, the, you do not get one force being distributed in the packet. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, and so, so this is this is a representative representative volume, uh, representative volume uh, of the uh, element, representative volume element. So what happens inside is so rich, but the the goal is to kind of put a box around it. Say this is one, right, and then. We're going to make a lot of boxes like that and see where it falls. But inside that box, none of this is correct because inside that box, every grain is under different stress, every grain is different topology. Uh, so you have to average this behavior, this complexity, and hope that it is possible. So you have an ensemble and it's yeah. described in the microscopic yeah. system with the macroscope property yeah. and all of that. Um, yeah, I, I get that. It's just hard for me to understand because it also conflicts with a lot of what we know about, like, for example, grand system and yeah. stresses and yeah. all of those things. It, it doesn't that much. And In fact, granular systems, they follow a power like this. There's just no thermal uh, dependence. It's a thermal mechanism. So the activation energy would be simply zero. Um, so, in fact, some labs explain this way the memory facts using granular material. Confined within hard boundaries, put on the sphere. Yeah, but we're talking different temperatures here. A thermal, oh, yeah, a single grain being yes. thermal versus you're injecting a macro scale temperature into the system, yeah. which induces these individual vibrations of the grain, which you ask how you erase the memory. When you increase the temperature, you, yeah. you're getting it closer to grounding, but never grounding. So, okay, I think you're talking now uh, at the crystal lattice uh, scale. And that is captured empirically uh, with the um, Arrhenius relationship. So when you, when you have an Arrhenius relationship, this I get to be the oldest person in the room. <laughs> I think this discussion should yeah, go on. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. You know, you're free to go. Okay. I'm not, I'm not uh, forcing you to stay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>